Hare Krishna, everybody. I hope you can still hear me and see my screen. Yes, we can. Hare Krishna. Okay. So thank you everyone for uh, joining the class uh, on a long weekend. Uh, you know, I, 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 I see that you are all very sincere and very eager to uh, hear Bhagavad Gita. That's very inspiring. You know, I just got a message, uh, you know, one of you are actually on a vacation, but, you know, you, you just wanted to let me know that you might drop uh, off the call because of poor connection. Uh, so, again, that's inspiring that despite of being on vacation, uh, you want to attend the class and, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't say it just for the sake of saying, you know, I'm also, you know, learning from all of you. And uh, when I see the enthusiasm in the students, I feel, you know, I should also be equally enthusiastic. And uh, so it's mutual, you know, we um, get inspired by each other's association. And that's the whole purpose of it. So uh, it's uh, devotional service is not something that is performed in solitude. And that's why this association is very helpful and it is infectious. So again, thank you very much. Uh, for uh, you know, inspiring me and showing your enthusiasm. Okay, so having said that, uh, I will be starting chapter two of Bhagavad Gita. That is very exciting. Uh, you know, we completed chapter one um, and uh, including the int introduction, we did cover a wide spectrum of topics, and uh, that gives us some idea on you know what will uh, come further in uh, the remaining chapters of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, you know, chapter two is where Krishna actually starts addressing the uh, concerns or arguments that were raised by Arjuna. In this chapter, Krishna will provide an analytical understanding of what the soul is, what the body is, what the difference is. So um, there's a lot to uh, learn in this chapter. 
So having said that, I think we can uh, get started. Uh, unless anyone has any questions from previous class or wants to make any comment uh, before we begin, then you may you are welcome to do that right now. Okay, if there are no further questions, comments, I think we can begin with the first uh, verse of the second chapter. Sanjaya uvacha tam tatha kripaya vistam ashru purna kulekshanam visidantam idam vakyam uvacha madhusudanaha. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Translation. Sanjaya said, seeing Arjuna full of compassion, his mind depressed, his eyes full of tears. Madhusudana Krishna spoke the following words. So, the where we concluded the first chapter, right? Arjuna makes a couple of arguments and then finally he, you know, puts aside his bow and arrow and then he just says this word, I will not fight. And so, you know, if you recall, Sanjaya is actually seeing this while sitting in Hastinapur along with Dhritarashtra because of the Divya Chakshu or the divine vision that he had, he was able to see what's going on. And so he's observing this and he's relaying this to Dhritarashtra. So he's telling this to Dhritarashtra. Now, what do you think is going on in Dhritarashtra's mind when he hears this? That Arjuna doesn't want to fight, right? Um, he would be, you know, in a way very happy because he you know Arjuna is, uh, is a very uh, expert, skilled archer, you know, he, and uh, he could definitely influence the outcome of the war. The fact that he doesn't want to fight, I think the Trashtra might be feeling happy. Okay, so let's see what uh, Shri Prabhupada explains uh, in the purport. So this is the context. And then after that, uh, Sanjaya basically tells the Trashtra, well, you know, after Arjuna said this, Krishna is, is speaking now. So, you know, let's see what Krishna says. So in the purport, Srila Prabhupada mentions that material comp uh, compassion, lamentation and tears, they are all signs of ignorance of the real self. So I'm just going to go back to the Kindle version. I have my notes over here. Yeah, so material compassion, lamentation and tears are all signs of ignorance of the real self. Compassion for the eternal soul is self-realization that's an important point right so when when a when we see or observe that someone is expressing compassion right or lamentation we have to see uh, what is the basis of that compassion and there is a saying in english that uh, compassion for the clothes of a drowning man has no value Right, if someone is drowning, and you know the one who is on the shore and seeing that this person is getting dr getting drowned, and that person is lamenting and showing compassion, compassion. Oh, such a nice clothes, you know. Now they are wet, right? So that compassion is misplaced. So that's the point it's trying to say. When when we see a compassion in someone, we have to see what is that compassion towards. You know, if that compassion is like you know lamentation for uh you know the clothes of a drowning man then you know that has no value so here Sri Sh Prabhupada that's the reason he's making this strong statement he's saying that okay they're all signs of ignorance of the real self because what's the word he used he used material compassion not ordinary compassion right so uh, uh, material compassion is ordinary compassion it's not based on the foundation of spirituality right when you understanding that this person is a soul then the body and the body is simply a covering right and then the compassion is based for the uh, for the self which is situated in the body then it is well placed just like the when a person is getting drowned the cloth that that person is wearing that is simply a covering right what is the real substance the real substance is the person who is wearing the clothes that person is going to die right 
So similar, that analogy can be further elaborated. What is elaborated? Same thing. The body is again an external covering of the soul. Okay. So in this context, the compassion that Arjuna was manifesting that was all based on bodily identification. Now, being a Kshatriya, Arjuna had fought many wars. And he's not new to, uh, you know, seeing violence or, you know, killing those who are not following dharma. You know, he has done this many times. It's not like a new recruit. It's, you know, sometimes when an army recruits soldiers, right, and they go through training uh, and they learn how to use different weapons and they go through, you know, different gradations of physical training. But when they are actually in a battlefield, right? That's a completely different environment. And if one is not of a Kshatriya mentality, they cannot survive. That's why many of the soldiers, when they come back, they have this PTSD syndrome, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a trauma from the war when they see that violence. So Arjuna is not in that situation. You know, obviously, he has seen a lot of violence. So why is he lamenting, right? It's not that he's first time he, he's seeing a death. He's lamenting because in this, you know, this time the the, the opponents, he is, he is related to them, right? And what is the basis of that relation? Basis of that relation is familial ties, right? And they, how does familial ties develop? They develop on the foundation of bodily conception of life. That I am this body, you know, and this is my gender, this is my race, or this is my situation within the society. This is, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a Pandava, a part of the Kuru dynasty, and then this is the extended uh, family. And so with that, the entire misconception, which is layered, this is multi-layered, it develops on the false conception of what the self is. Just like a doctor, an expert surgeon, you know, say, let's say a neurosurgeon or a heart surgeon, and that person, you know, that, that surgeon might have done so many surgeries all, all, all life, successfully, complicated, really difficult surgeries. Now, suppose that surgeon has to operate someone from the family, right? Someone that, that uh, person who with whom uh, that individual is related to, is very attached, has a lot of emotions. And so what might happen? You know, the person, would, that surgeon would go nervous, right? You know, what if I commit a mistake, right? There's a lot at stake. And so it's, it's, it's very difficult in that situation. So, you know, you can, you can think that something similar is going on with Arjuna, right? It's like an expert surgeon who has done so many surgeries, but this time, you know, he, the, he's, he's intimately related uh, in, in his daily, uh, whatever his prescribed duty is, right? Just like a surgeon, when he operates, someone uh, whom he has a lot of, uh, he or she has a lot of affection for. Okay. So the word Madhu Shudana is significant in this verse. Lord Krishna killed the demon Madhu. And now Arjuna wanted to kill the demon of misunderstanding that had overtaken him in the discharge of his duty. So, um, the I had mentioned this earlier that any time you know Krishna has unlimited names, and any time a particular name is being used, it's not randomly you know chosen. Not that sometimes it's called Madhusudana, sometimes Rishikesha. Whenever somebody is he, Krishna or anyone for that matter in Vedic culture, a person could have more than one names. When that person is addressed by a particular name, it is very contextual. In that situation, that name is very appropriate. So then that brings us a question: Why is the name Madhusudana very appropriate in this context? The, so for that, we need to understand who the demon Madhu was that Krishna had killed. So. The, so Brahma's day is very long. Within the one day of Brahma or the daylight of Brahma, there are the four yugas, they are repeated 1000 times, right? And this night is equally long. So in one particular occasion, when Brahma's day was about ending and the night was about to begin, uh, the Vedas, which actually are emanated from the uh, mouth of Brahma, 
of course, Brahma receives the knowledge from Krishna, and then Brahma actually uh, further propagates this knowledge. So it is all mystical. We'll, we'll, we'll study in in the later sections, you know, how actually the entire um, you know knowledge of the of the Vedas can be transmitted through sound vibration. I mean, at some level, we understand that. So what happened was these demons, uh, Madhu, and there was another demon called Kaitava. They came and stole the Vedas from uh, Brahma as he was winding down the day, right? And uh, he, he, it, the Vedas were in the sound vibration form, so they they assumed some sort of uh, you know subtle form, and you know when they they actually inhaled it, just like Brahma exhales and you know he speaks out, it emanates from his uh, mouth. Similarly, these demons, they had mystical powers, asuras. And they, they, were, they, they were actually uh, grasping the knowledge. And they said, okay, you know, if we take the Vedic knowledge away, then the population in general would be deprived of it when the new day begins or whatever uh, the case might be. So in, in that particular occasion, Krishna appears in a particular incarnation as a Hayagriva. So Krishna obviously has, you know, uh, we talked about it, he has many different incarnations, right? So you have Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, Narsinga. So he also assumes different uh, forms of life which are not human forms of life, right? Which in a way you can say that they are lower species of life because um, unlike humans, they don't have an advanced, uh, uh, you know, discrimination. For, for, for instance, they cannot understand spirituality. So Kurma form was for uh, lifting the uh, Mandara mountain. The whole is a pastime of Samundra Manthana, the churning of the milk ocean. Then as a Matsya incarnation or the fish incarnation, uh, the, when, the, when the, uh, the universe was inundated by the waters of devastation uh, in, in, in the form of a gigantic fish, he saved King Satyavrata along with other species of life, and again the you know the Vedas uh, and the seven sages. Similarly, um, yeah, Varaha, the boar incarnation, the Lord lifted the earth which had fallen down into the nether regions. So similarly, in this particular incarnation, the Lord assumed the form of Haya Griva. So Griva means neck, and Haya refers to the horse. So this was a horse-headed or horse, uh, you know, shaped uh, incarnation of the Lord. At least the upper part of the body was a half human, half horse, just like Narshimma, half lion, half man. And the the thing about horse, is, so if you look at the, all the previous incarnations in the animal form that I mentioned, those different incarnations were very suitable for that particular purpose. For instance, Varaha, is, is a boar incarnation and why lord appeared in the form of a boar just like you know the boar they go into filthy places right so when the earth had fallen into a filthy place lord assume a form of a boar now that form is completely transcendental it's not the form of it's not a mundane form like an ordinary pig or a hog right but in order to perform that particular task Lord assumes that formed is just because it's suitable. Just like uh, Matsya, when the water is getting, the entire world was inundated. The three, the three worlds were inundated with the waters of devastation. Which form can easily swim? A form of a fish. So the Lord assumed the form of a fish. Right. Um, so in this way, the specialty about horse is unlike other creatures, you know, if you think, well, giraffe has a very long neck, but, you know, uh, he, apart from that, there are not many animals which have a long neck, like horse particularly has it. Now, the thing about horse is that it's not just about the length of the neck, but there is something unique about the, the uh, respiratory system of the horse. For instance, you know, if we are gasping and we need to breathe very hard, we will start breathing from our mouth. But a horse does not do that. His, his mouth and his, uh, you know, the, the mouth of the horse and the, and the nose of the horse, they are not connected. He always breathes with his uh, uh, nose. And as the speed of the horse increases, the amount of air the 
horse breathes in also increases. It's 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 uh, it's proportional to the speed of horse. So and there are a lot of other. This is according to all uh, you know detailed scientific uh, uh, information that is available to us. But beyond that, there is also you know something special about the horse in a much more subtle and significant way that I also don't fully understand it. But to give an example, scriptures, the Sastra, it is said that just like the backside of cow is pure, right? Because cow dung is pure. Bull dung is not pure, right? That's why in English there is a word they use is BS, right? So that means that has no value to it. Bull, yeah, bull's dung has no value. But cow dung has unlimited value, you know, it is pure. There's nothing impure about it. All other creatures, except the cow, not even the bull, right? Uh, their excreta is all impure. The only exception is cow's dung. There is a lot of antiseptic properties. You know, the, the cow dung is used for lining the, the walls uh, of the hut, um, and there are unlimited other benefits. So similarly, it is said that the front part, just like the back part of the cow is pure, the front part, that means the mouth, of the horse is considered pure. So Lord assumed the form of Hayagriva, and in that particular form, he he inhaled the, the Vedas, which you are emanating from the mouth of Brahma before the demons could take it away. So that's just uh, some uh, background I wanted to provide, because why is it important? Because by it's only through Vedic knowledge that one can develop correct or proper discrimination and remove all the misunderstanding. And now Arjuna is going through a misunderstanding right now in terms of his in in in, in terms of uh, the fact that he's confused about what his duty is, what is right, what is wrong, what he should be doing. So that's the reason he is addressed here as Madhusudana because just like Krishna in his previous incarnation um, had made sure that the Vedic knowledge is preserved uh, in order to, in order for the benefit of the populace to empower them to uh, overcome any kind of challenges or dilemma that they might face. Vedic knowledge is very important. So just like Krishna had enabled that for the entire universe, Arjuna, you know, being his friend, a devotee, a cousin, you know, he's going through that similar situation. And so here Krishna is addressed as Madhusudana, like, hey, just as you, you know, kill the demon Madhu, please help the help me by killing the this demon of confusion uh, by providing me proper knowledge. So that's the import of using the word compassion. So here Srila Prabhupada again mentions compassion for the dress of a drowning man is senseless. We already talked about that. Man fallen in the ocean of nations cannot be saved simply by rescuing his outward dress, his material body. So we also talked about that example. One who does not know this and laments for the outward dress is called sudra or one who laments unnecessarily. So definition of sudra is sochti iti sudra. Uh, one who laments all the time, that is the position of a miser. Uh, so that unnecessary lamentation is is discouraged, right? Sochtiti Sudra. Arjuna was a Kshatriya and this conduct was not expected from him. So that's why Krishna is actually, you know, you'll see in the next verse uh, what Krishna says. But this is behavior that is not expected of a Kshatriya, right? You know, he should, he should not lament uh, for something that is not worthy of lamenting. And we'll see why it is not worthy of lamentation in the upcoming verse. Um, Lord Krishna, however, can dissipate the lamentation of the ignorant man. And for this purpose, Bhagavad Gita was sung. This chapter instructs us in the realization by an analytical study of the material body and the spirit souls. I mentioned that. In detail, Krishna will explain what is soul, what is its nature, what is its characteristics, how is it different from the body. This realization is possible when one when one works without attachment to the fruity results and is situated in the fixed conception of the real self. So 
uh, we'll we'll see what the real self is and then how one can work without attachment to the fruity results because we see why why is arjuna's what's the source of arjuna's uh, misery because he is thinking fruity results means one is thinking how the results of this activity the fruit right any fruit is the result the fruit or the result or the outcome how it's going to affect me he's thinking if i win then i won't be able to enjoy because all my relatives you know who are very near and dear to me with whom i want to share my success they won't be there so that is a fruitive consideration uh and why is that right what was the basis again again basis was you know he's thinking well i want to share my success with my near and dear ones and what is the foundation of near and dear ones it is again on a bodily conception of life so that's why uh, the statement is made over here that this realization uh, of the self is only possible when one works without attachment of fruity results and vice versa i know how can one work without attachment to fruity results when when re, when a person really understands what the self is right so it kind of feeds into each other and if one doesn't understand what the self is then they you know they would they would be attached to the outcome of the activity okay so i think that's the end of the purport anyone has any questions on this particular words no okay so I, can... I, have a, i have a question yes so in the first verse it's sanjay vacha um can you tell me uh, can you explain the significance of sanjay like what uh, what's his role in this yes chapter yeah so He, he, the very first first verse in bhagavad gita was also spoken by sanjaya and i think the last verse of the first chapter was also spoken by sanjaya so in the beginning of bhagavad gita uh, so sanjaya he is a a you know a minister of uh, dhritarashtra and he had this boon by which he could see and hear things which are distant right he doesn't need to be personally present and dhritarashtra he was blind and being a blind you know he could not directly participate in the war right i mean he cannot fight uh, and according to the kshatriya codes again a blind person cannot be the king that was the whole reason though dhritarashtra was elder than pandu he was not appointed the king because he was blind uh, and so pandu became the king but then he's saying okay but my sons i cannot be the king but my sons should become the king now pandu died and so for temporarily because the, the, the children they were small both the kauravas and the pandavas so they didn't have any other alternatives so they installed a blind king so and and uh, so so dhritarashtra wanted to know what's going on now he's very attached to his son duryodhan and he he wants him to be the king and ultimately this war is about to begin uh, that's the only way now they can resolve the issue so dhritarashtra uh, he 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 wants to know what's going on so luckily he has sanjaya who can see what is happening at a distant place so now sanjaya is 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 describing the events that are taking place on the battlefield so that's why in the beginning sanjaya says that okay at kurukshetra dharmakshetre kurukshetre samvetta yutsava you know the pandavas and the kauravas are assembled and the war is about to begin so he is describing live whatever he is observing and uh, at the end of the first chapter then he is telling okay this this is happened and finally arjuna does not want to fight so he is conveying that to uh, dhritarashtra so whenever sanjay says he is actually saying to dhritarashtra in his audience there is no one else okay so thank you yeah okay so next verse Okay, so now Krishna finally speaks, right? Well, in first chapter, Krishna actually does speak once, but you know, it's not any philosophical statement. I think it was the twenty-fifth verse where Arjuna tells Krishna that, hey, you know, I, I want to see whoever assembled to fight. Can you please take the chariot in the middle of the two armies? So Krishna complies, and that's why he's referred to as Rishi Kesha. And then he goes in the middle of the battlefield and tells to Arjuna, behold. 
see. That's the only word he says. Behold the assembly of Kurus or the Kurus who have come over here to fight. Now, actually, Krishna will start speaking. And uh, there's a lot in this verse. So I think we can begin, chant the sloka. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Kutastva Kasmalam Idam Visame Sampu Samupasthitam Anarya Justam Aswargyam Akirti Karamarjuna. So if you notice here the word used is Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. Here the word Bhagavan is used. And if you go back to the 25th uh, sloka of the first chapter where Krishna speaks, tells Arjuna that behold the Kurus who have assembled over here, at that instance he is not referred to as a Bhagavan. Right? So here see, just behold Partha, the Kurus who have assembled here. Uh, in, in the trans in the translation of Prabhupada translates him as the Lord, but uh, Actually, it's continuation of the 24th verse where 24th Krishna actually is addressed, I believe, as Rishikesha, right? Yeah, he's addressed as Rishikesha. So he's not uh, referred to as Bhagavan. So there is a significance to this word Bhagavan that Srila Prabhupada would explain uh, and why it is very important. Translation, the Supreme Personality of Godhead said, My dear Arjuna, how have these impurities come upon you? They are not at all befitting a man who knows the value of life. They lead not to higher planets, which is heavenly planets, but to infamy. So, he basically, uh, so he, here Sri Bhagawan is translated as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You might have word, heard this uh, word many times and you might be wondering, what is this? You know why you're, use, you're using three different words to refer to the word Bhagawan. So, so far Krishna, you know, has not been referred to as the Supreme Personality of God, Godhead. In this context, he is being referred to. So, personality is, is that word is used just to make it very clear that, that you know, uh, the ultimate truth is a person. Because it is a misconception, right? The Mayavad theory or the impersonal idea of the absolute truth, where uh, I think we talked about this in much more detail in the introduction, uh, where the impersonalists, they think that, well, absolute truth has no form, has no name, no past times. And then the ultimate truth, which is formless, assumes a form when it appears on this earth. So that's a common misconception. So I want to remove that misconception to make it very clear that no, 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 ultimate truth is not formless. Rather, the formless aspect of the ultimate truth is just one of the insignificant features of the Lord. And we will talk about more in the, in the purport. So the personality is just em emphasizing that the absolute truth is a person. And that person is not an ordinary person, it's the supreme person. Because as soon as, you know, why, why is the idea of person rejected? Because they think that, well, the truth means the truth has to be unlimited. How can, and the person is always limited, right? If I'm, I'm a person, I'm limited by my form, right? There's only, you know, I, I, I don't know what's going on in the mind and the bodies or experiences of other individuals. My experience is limited to myself. My ability to do things, either physically or mentally, is limited by the kind of body that I have, right? So body then becomes... A, a, the, in our experience, we see that body is, is a limiting factor. So the word supreme emphasizes that this personality or the person or the form is not an ordinary form. It's not a material body. It's, it's a spiritual or it's a supreme, right? It's not, it's not restricted by the, what is ordinarily, you know, in our ordinary experience, we see limitations of a form or a person. And Godhead, again, you know, instead of God, what's Godhead? So it's similar to the word fountain head, right? A found, from a fountain head, we see, you know, a fountain head typically, you know, have many nozzles. And from that nozzles, the you will you'll see spouts of water 
right? They take a trajectory and they go in different direction. There are multiple spouts of water. So, and so that's one fountain head is the source of all those water spouts. Similarly, Godhead is the source of all the incarnations of the Lord, right? So, you know, it specifically refers to Krishna or Vishnu Tattva or in, in, in truest of true sense, it refers only to Krishna. But we see that, uh, you know, it could be referred to other uh, Vishnu Tattvas also. And so, let's you can say it's an English translation of the word Bhagwan, And we'll also really go into the technical definition of the word Bhagwan that is provided by Parasar Muni. So that's what... Uh, the word Supreme Personality of Godhead um, that is used um, in this text widely. So Krishna is saying, Arjuna, how has this impurities come upon you? And they are not befitting a person who knows the value of a life. And if you give up your duty, it's, you know, you will first of all miss the opportunity to uh, achieve higher destination. So uh, we discussed in the first chapter that a uh, warrior or a Kshatriya who actually dies while fighting, you know, gives up his life while performing the prescribed duty. The prescribed duty of Kshatriya is to, you know, um, to be engaged, first of all, in the protection of the uh, civilians or the citizens. And for that, uh, they might fight a war which is for a right cause and according to the right in, uh, injunctions or the codes of engagement in war and while doing that if they die you know they achieve heavenly planets uh, so he says first of all if you give up your duty you will not achieve heavenly planets moreover it will lead to infamy because everyone will say you know they they won't no one will give you a sympathetic heart and they will that you know hey oh arjuna because of compassion of his grandfather and teacher uh, and his family members he did not fight they won't they won't think like that you are thinking but they won't they won't buy that ar argument they will say that oh, arjuna is a coward right um, and we see that that happened to uh, you, you, you know the past time of krishna krishna is known as ranachod and Jarasand called him a coward. So Jarasand was the king of Magad, which is present in Bihar. He attacked Mathura 17 times. Every single time, Krishna single-handedly defeated the entire army of Jarasand. And then you, you would just leave Jarasand. You would not kill him. Single-handedly. But you know, on the 18th instance, uh, Krishna, at the same time, there was another uh, Kali Yavan who was attacking. And he said, okay, you know, it's enough, enough. You know, I'll just take my uh, all the yadus away and then he goes to Dwarka. And so because he ran away from the battlefield, he's called a coward. Rana chod. Rana means battlefield. Chod means one who goes up, runs away. Now, because Krishna is absolute, any kind of, uh, you know, ill mouthing or bad words that any might, anyone might uh, speak towards Krishna or tries to criticize him, that also becomes his glorification. So he's worshipped as Ranachodorai. So you can go to Gujarat, Thakur. There is this temple of Ranachodorai. Uh, it's a very famous temple. He's worshipped in that form. Uh, in Gujarat, especially people love uh, Krishna in, in this particular form as Ranachod. So Krishna, you know, you can see he has his experience. Now, Krishna, why did he run away? He's, you know, he's not afraid of Jarasand. Right? He single-handedly defeated Jarasand and his entire army so many times. Why did he run away? He ran away out of compassion. Because saying every time all these soldiers unnecessarily die, and you know this person is not understanding the lesson, every time my citizens of Mathura, they are put into this anxiety, you know. So, you know, it's not about the ego of me trying to prove that, you know, I can defeat him. I, I, let me be compassionate, right? And then out of compassion, he runs away, right? Now, when he runs away, right, the Jarasan did not think, oh, out of compassion, he ran away. Or people they didn't think, oh, he's a coward, he ran away, right? That's why in the end, when Bhima, Arjuna, and Krishna, they go to Jarasan as Brahmanas and they uh, say that, hey, we, we want uh, a charity. Give us the charity to fight. And then finally, they reveal the identity. They say, I'm Krishna. He's, you know, this is Bhima, Arjuna. He says, oh, Krishna, you have come to fight with me. You are a coward. You already ran away. I'm not going to fight with you, you see. So that... 
you know that that infamy remained with him all his life so krishna is saying to arjuna you know you you think people will appreciate your compassion that's not going to happen so that's the advice that krishna is uh, giving to arjuna yeah. okay so in the purport here yeah bhagwan so shri prabhupada says krishna and the supreme personality of godhead are identical there is no difference therefore krishna is referred to as bhagwan so the definition of the word bhagwan is provided in uh, I believe it's vishnu puran by parasar muni um, it says aishwarasya samagrasya virasya yasha shriya gyan vairagyam sannam uh, sannam bhagam iti gana so bhagwan bhaga means opulence wan means possessor so the word bhagwan refers to someone who is complete or has the most proportion or the most amount of six opulences so whoever is greatest in this in six criteria or six opulences only that person can be referred as bhagwan so what are these six opulences aishwarya so aishwarya refers to uh, wealth or opulence so we can see krishna when he was present on this earth he you know first was in mathura then he you know established this amazing city of dwarka and this dwarka is a, 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 you know the archaeological survey of india you know they have been excavating and they're finding uh, after india were independent it, it they found that there are two islands off the coast of gujarat now they are completely submerged in the ocean and e the size of each island was about twice the size of manhattan right and there are two islands uh, of this uh, size now this is away from the land right it's in middle of the ocean but this entire city you know it was made up of uh, marble and corals and you know gold and jewels uh um, exquisitely beautiful and there were you know elephants and you know all this you know it's it's extremely opulent city and so from an external perspective you can see that you know it's uh, there this city was unparalleled but from another understanding we know that krishna is a master of the entire uh, jagannath another name of krishna is jagannath he is the lord of the entire universe what to speak about one city of dwarka right so in when it comes to opulence no one is equal to krishna in terms of the wealth i mean the entire universe emanates from him you know brahma himself emanates from the body of vishnu and vishnu is expansion of krishna so krishna is the original source ishvarasya samagrasya virasya veer strength or valor when it comes uh, no one can match krishna like just krishna was few days old and he killed the demoness putana right in the pretext of uh, you know just sucking her life breath when she was trying to poison the child and after that just in vrindavan gokula even before we moved to nandgaon when he was in gokul for the first 5 years there so many demons he killed just as a baby you know as a, in his first birthday he kicked the cart demon satkasura and uh, right so satkasura then there are so many other bakasura Uh, Dhenuka Sura, Keshi Demon, right? Vyoma Sura, Aga Sura, right? Trina Varta, the Tornado Demon. There is an entire list. And then you know he chastised uh, so many of the powerful kings like Shishupal, right? Uh, then Danta Vakra in the end, Shalva. So when it comes to valor, this is just in past times of Krishna. And then is another incarnations. You know he has killed. hiranyakashipu as narsimha dev and you know so when it comes to strength no one can match krishna virasya yashah fame right there is no one else in the world so who whose past times or his activities they are talked about in all the yugas eternally all the time right now if you see there is no other book we are reading bhagavad gita now at, at this point in time there is no other text which is as ancient as bhagavad gita right 
Bhagavad Gita was spoken 5,500 years ago at the end of Dwapar Yuga, right? Uh, is there any other text right now, right? No, right? Still Krishna's birthday is celebrated, Janmashtami, you see, you know, there are, especially in India, like hundreds and thousands of people, you know, they just come and they, they celebrate his birthday. So when it comes to fame, no one can match Krishna. Even what is considered as a criticism becomes his glorification. We just talked about Ranachoda Rai. Right. When you, you know, you, you try to criticize him as a coward, but that is his glorification, his worship as him. Makhana Chor, right, a thief, right, but that is also his glorification. So, Sishupal, he said so many things, you know, more than 100 ill words that he spoke about Krishna. And then our Acharyas, they have analyzed and they have provided that actually each of those words has double meaning. And, you know, though it was spoken in an ill way, by the grace of Mother Saraswati, you can provide a uh, spiritual or, uh, sorry, the, the, the glory, the another understanding which is glorification of Krishna. So, Yashaha, Shriya, beauty, right? Krishna is known as Shyama Sundar. He is blackish, blue complexion. So, Shyama generally, you know, the black color, generally the people have this idea that, you know, they, it's not something very appealing. But Krishna's blackish complexion is, com complexion is not uh, unpleasant to look at. That's why the word Shama Sundara is beautiful. Tribhanga is broken as three three places. You know, we see Krishna holding his flute like this. His 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 uh, you know head is uh, bending. So his three it is the when he stands is very beautiful to look at. But his form bends bends at three places. One is neck, one is waist, and another is knees. Right. Then he is now Yovanam. Always youthful. So at the time of Mahabharata war, Krishna, he was more than 100 years old. He was great grandfather. He has multi many great, great grandchildren. Uh, but he never looked older than a 16 year old youthful boy. Right? He never grows past that age. And he is also known as Madana Mohana. Madan means Cupid. There is no one in this world who can be. Uh, you know, can, can resist the arrows of Cupid, even Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma, right? Even there are incidences in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam that is described that Brahma actually, he, he his mind got so agitated, he was attracted by his own daughter, right? Shiva, we see the past time, he was attracted by Mohini Murti, right? Now, Goddess of Lakshmi who is the most beautiful amongst all, she is always serving Vishnu, right? She, she is massaging his feet. She is always embracing Vishnu, but Vishnu is never agitated, right? Uh, so that is another characteristics of uh, Krishna. But he, but the thing is, he is so attractive. Everyone is attracted to him. Madan Mohan, Madan, yeah, coming back to Madan Mohan. Madan Mohan means Cupid, the one who attracts attracts everyone in the universe. That individual is attracted by Krishna. So Mohan means one who is attracted. But who, so Krishna attracts attracts even the Cupid. So another name of Krishna is Madana Mohan. So Yashaha, Shriya, uh, Jnana and Vairagya. And when it comes to knowledge, there is no one who is more knowledgeable than Krishna. So one is Bhagavad Gita, you know, this text which is the compendium of all philosophy that is worthy of knowing in this world is all compounded in this text. He's the original, he's, he's the original source of the Vedas. Um, all the Vedas come from him. All the uh, Vedic literature it emanates from him, right? So he and beyond that, as a Paramatma, is residing in, along with the Atma in each and every living entity in all the universes of the creation. And, and as Paramatma, he knows the past, present, and future of every single living entity, right? So in that sense also he is all Sarvajnani, right? He, he knows all the, no, uh, everything, right? It's not just about the Vedic knowledge, but he knows uh, what's going on in every nook and corner of the creation. Uh, and Jnana and Vairagya, and when it comes to renunciation, so all this we understand, right? So this four, five opulences, everyone, uh, can relate that these five opulences are something desirable. 
we also have this phi opulences in limited context. Somebody might be more, you know, beautiful. Somebody might be more wealthy. Somebody might have more knowledge. But you will never find someone who is, who is, who has all the qualities. And even if they have all the qualities, they would they would not have it in the supremely possible, the maximum amount that is possible that we, is only found in Krishna. So everyone can relate to that. But what about renunciation? Why is renunciation is also a quality that is worth having? Vairagya. Just like, you know, um, somebody who who is a pauper, who does not have anything, right? He might have a very meager amount of wealth, right? And that person might donate or give something in charity then that is does not catch so much attention right now with bill gates he donates 99 percent of his wealth for charity right and being such a rich person he's giving you know almost entire <laughs> wealth that he had for charity then you know that is very commendable right so in that sense renunciation is also an opulence right it leads to fame not that you know, uh, such individuals are motivated by fame necessarily. Some of them might be, but um, they might be genuinely be charitable. And that might, that's something that is appreciated. The point is not about fame, but the fact that, uh, you know, people appreciate that someone who actually renounces everything for a higher cause. And when it comes to renunciation, in many different incarnations of Krishna has shown uh, renunciation in his original form as Krishna after winding up the past times after Kurukshetra war and uh, is over he knows okay the purpose for which I have had appeared has been achieved uh, you know he goes to Vrindavan and he again meets the gopis and he marries them uh, as he had originally promised he was away from Vrindavan for 100 years but he finally meets them and he says, you know, I have killed all the demons, Shishupal, Dantvakra, Salva, Jarasan, Kamsa, the burden of this earth is, is uh, you know, and, and obviously uh, Duryodhan and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, his uh, supporters. So he says, now it's time for me to wind up my pastimes. And then he arranges where his own family members, you know, from a material perspective, you know, you can say that, you know, Yadus, he, he, they all engage in a fratricidal war, you know, they go to uh, Prabhash Shetra in Gujarat and, you know, they are intoxicated by arrangement, uh, his arrangement is just an excuse for them to give up their uh, discrimination, they fight with each other and, you know, they, they, they basically all of them die. And after them, after that he arranges for he himself to get shot by an arrow in his lake by a hunter. Now, you know, we see that no one no one dies by getting hurt in the leg, right? That's why, you know, they, uh, cops, you know, they are advised that if you want to make sure that that person does not die, shoot him in the leg, right? So Krishna, you know, whereas a one few days old child, he had killed Putana and so many de demons. There's no way he could uh, be shot by a hunter. After that, you know, when the hunter comes to apologize, you know, he, he tells, don't worry, you know, this is my arrangement. I wanted you to be an instrument in my departure. And since you have performed this service, you will go back to spiritual world. So right in the front of the eyes of Krishna, a Vaikuntha airplane comes, the hunter is, goes to the spiritual world. And then the chariot of uh, Krishna rises up in the sky. All his paraphernalia, Sankha Chakra Gadapadma, they assume pers a personal form. And they, they request Krishna to mount the chariot and then Krishna goes back to the abode. So, uh, and what he does after that, the entire city of Dwarka, he ar arranges to be consumed by the ocean. Then he tells his uh, chariot driver, Daruka, go and tell the residents of Dwarka that leave the city in seven days, the ocean is going to consume it. Right? And all the 16,108 queens of uh, of Krishna and you know other queens and you know they come to Prabhas and they all perform sati and they also give up uh, their life. So in this way, the most opulent, you know, the city and you know all his uh, relatives and all he all arranges for all of them to wind up their pastimes. So you know he shows extreme renunciation. So again, the point being, 
The reason I'm explaining all this in detail is to make the point that the word Bhagwan, you see, it's used very liberally in the present world. And, you know, there are so many, even individuals, what to speak about demigods or devas, even, even ordinary mortals we see in this world, you know, they are referred to as Bhagwan. But, but the point of explaining this in detail is that as Parasar Muni defines and is described in the scriptures, this this uh, definition it only refers to Krishna and no one else, you know, not, not even the Devas. Sometimes powerful demigods like Shiva might be referred, but Shiva is a special category, you know, Shiva Tattva, I think I wrote that blog, which I had shared with you earlier, like Shiva Tattva is different from Jiva Tattva and also from Vishnu Tattva. So from some perspective sometimes that word is used even in scriptures uh, to refer to shiva but in general the word bhagavan in its original sense it refers to krishna exclusively so bhagavan is the ultimate absolute truth is the point clear before we move on why krishna is referred only krishna and only krishna is referred to as bhagavan and what the supreme personality of godhead means is there any questions uh, you can this would be a good time to ask Okay, so Bhagavan is the ultimate abs absolute truth. The absolute truth is realized in three phases of understanding, namely Brahman, which is the impersonal aspect of the Lord, the Paramatma, which is the localized aspect of the Supreme, which resides in each and every living entity in, in the heart of all the living entities, and Bhagavan or the personality of Godhead. So the absolute truth has three features. I think we talked about this Satta, Chitta, Ananda. Sat means eternality. So the Lord or the Supreme Truth is realized in three features. Eternality, or which is all pervading uh, or, or ever existing, then all knowledge, all knowing, and then uh, supremely joyful. So when people in this world, they are frustrated in the, from the, the incessant anxieties and difficulties that will eventually is, uh, inevitably uh, manifest in this world. They want to get free from that misery. There's repeated birth, there is death, and uh, the soul wants to be eternal, but it's it's artificially subjected to death, right? So the first thing that the soul seeks is eternality, and that is the impersonal aspect of the Lord. So the Brahma, Brahman, or the 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 Brahma Jyoti, which is emanating from spiritual planets, the soul might want to just merge in that light. And in that form, the soul experiences eternality because it does not have the covering of a material body, which is going to be subjected to repeated death. But that experience of eternality or Sat, the soul is not satisfied because the desire for eternality is only one aspect. Then the soul will realize, oh, okay, okay, this is what I first need, wanted, but actually I also want to be all, be all knowing, right? Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, being part of Brahma Jyoti, one is experiencing eternality, but it doesn't have any means to know anything beyond it, right? There is no knowledge of anything beyond it. There is no interaction. There is nothing. It's just experience of eternality. So naturally the soul wants some chit, means knowledge. And by focusing on Paramatma, by worshipping Paramatma, who is all knowing. So Paramatma, the Brahman feature is eternality, but the Paramatma feature is not only eternality because Paramatma is eternal. Paramatma does not take birth, Paramatma does not die. But apart from eternality, Paramatma is all knowing. Paramatma knows past, present and future of all the living entities. Right? So the knowledge and eternality both are realized in Paramatma. But with Paramatma, we cannot engage in the five rasas of devotion, which is servitorship, friendship, parental affection, conjugal affection. That is not, we cannot have that relationship with Paramatma. Right? That relationship can only happen with the Supreme Person, which is Bhagavan. And in Bhagavan or Sri Krishna, we find Satta, eternality, chitta, knowledge, and ananda, bliss. So that's why it is saying that the truth can be realized in three phases, which are, which are nested. You know, there's an incremental uh, realization of eternality, knowledge, and 
uh, bliss. So I hope that is clear. Anyone has any questions on that? OK, yes. So uh, I didn't understand, I didn't understand part, 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 uh, but uh, I understand, I understand that, that which is eternality. Uh, Chit is ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh, to experience Ananda, we, we need to see the Bhagavan in, in the in, in a form of Krishna. Or you know, is it like um, you, you usually I, I hear that you know such such the such the Ananda uh, is actually is referred to Paramatma. So is it is it um, to have Ananda, uh, what, what is it yeah. actually referring to? Like, is it like he's always blissful? Uh, by what? I'll, I'll I'll explain that. So, right now we are talking about experience of the soul. The soul wants to experience eternality. The soul wants to experience all knowledge. The soul wants to experience all bliss, right? So it is about us that we want because we are subjected to uh, non-eternality. When we are put into this body, this body is you know, subject to disease, ailments, and finally death. So my, I want to be eternal, but because I've assumed this false identity, I cannot experience eternality. So when one ex realizes the Brahman, the yogis, when they realize the Brahman and they achieve the impersonal liberation, they don't have a material body. Actually, the soul just becomes a particle in the rays which are emanating from the spiritual planets but those rays are very glaring they cannot see where this light is coming from so now that soul is not subjected to death so it experiences eternality but after some time we realize okay i am not subject to death but there is no engagement for me i want to know i want to gain knowledge but when one re when the soul finally realizes that Brahman is not, okay, Brahman is just one aspect, but the Paramatma aspect is not only eternal, but it is all knowing because Paramatma knows past, present and future of all living entities. So when one realizes Paramatma, by the grace of Paramatma, one also gains all knowledge. So is that clear, that part? And then I will explain Ananda. Yes, that part is clear. Okay. Now Ananda means joy. Now jo joy, how do we experience joy? Suppose I am all knowing and I am eternal, right? So, so you know, it's for instance, you can say I can well in, in one way information technology has enabled us to get all knowledge, right? Within few keys, I can download any Kindle book, I can you know look up on Wikipedia, I can get all the information that so I'm in that sense, you can say in, in a reduced or limited way, say I you know I have all knowledge. And, uh, you know, if I'm not bothered by any disease or, you know, like I, if I'm able to do this all the time, after some time you will get bored, right? I mean, by gaining all information and knowledge and, you know, being not subjected to other miseries, I still want bliss. That means, and where, how do I get bliss? Through socialization. I like to spend time with my family members, my friends, right? And they provide me rasa or enjoyment, right? And, you know, it is said that somebody who is really good, active social life, you know, if we say that, oh, this person, you know, is so blessed that he has really good social life. And what I mean by that is not only he has, you know, good children, not only he has a very nice uh, spouse, uh, not only beyond that, the person has a lot of, uh, you know, very nice, helpful friends and, uh, you know, is individual is also very lucky to have, uh, you know, very caring uh, parents, right? So the, the all these members together create my entire social uh, circle. And sometimes what happens is, well, you know, you in in everyone's life there is no one who has all all of these, right? Maybe there are very rare individuals who are lucky to have, you know, everything. And sometimes, you know, maybe your near and dear friend hurt us by saying something or doing something, and that might bother us. Though I have might have a perfect relationship with my other family members, or you know, even my employer or workplace colleagues. But you know, one particular incident might sour with one particular individual might sour my experience of happiness. 
So when it comes to Ananda, Ananda actually comes from personal relationships in association. That gives us real bliss. That's the whole argument of Arjun. I say, okay, you know, I will get unlimited wealth. I'll get, you know, this, that. But with whom I'm going to enjoy, everyone that I love and cherish, they will be all dead. Right? That was the cause of Arjuna's problem, Ananda. With whom shall I experience Ananda? So the problem in this world is that just like we are imperfect, everyone is imperfect uh, because of our material conditioning of, uh, you know, the three modes of nature, Sattva, Raja, Tamas. We want a perfect relationship, but we are seeking that perfect relationship as a servant, as a friend, as a conjugal lover, as a parent with imperfect people. Right? As much as we are imperfect, others are imperfect. And that call, that is the cause of our frustration. And just like the soul wants to be eternal, but is artificially subjected to death. Similarly, we want to experience all knowledge, but we are artificially put into ignorance. And in that same way, we want to experience unlimited happiness, ananda. But we are artificially put into a situation where we are not able to experience this. But just like when we are hungry, there is a means to satisfy hunger. When we are thirsty, we see that nature has made an arrangement to satisfy our thirst. Whenever there is need, we also find whatever need there might be, we find that the means to fulfill that need is supplied by the nature. Similarly, the need for eternality, all knowledge and all enjoyment should also be possible. But we see that it is impossible in this particular, uh, you know, uh, this particular section or part of the universe of, or the creation, right? From Krishna and by, from Vedic knowledge, we can understand that this is not our real identity. It is possible for us to achieve this things because there is a need that the, the the means to satisfy the need should also be available but it's not available here it is available in the spiritual world just like if you say that i am thirsty i might be in the desert you know say i am in sahara and if i you know traverse the entire desert of sahara and i'm only looking for water i won't find water what i will find is a mirage an illusion of water and then I might run after that illusion or the mirage and I would be misled. And I can just keep on chasing that mirage, but I will never find water. Or if I find something which might be very dirty or very polluted and very limited. Similarly, but, but, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean the water does not exist. And you might think, oh, it, it, it must not exist. You know, I, it's not a small tract of land that I seek water for. I, I, I traverse the entire the subcontinent of uh, Africa, entire northern part of Africa. Certainly, there must not be any water, right? But he's looking at the wrong place, right? Similarly, the we the we are we are looking for satta, chitta, and ananda, but we are looking at the wrong place. You know, we can try it for millions of lifetimes, and we if we keep on looking at the wrong place, we won't achieve it. So that ananda can be experienced in these five relationships as servitorship, as a friendship, in parental affection and conjugal affection with the perfect person. A perfect relationship can be established with a perfect person. Now, you, someone might argue that, okay, what about we are imperfect, we are minute, but Krishna is not affected by our impurities. He is absolute. He is not dependent on it. He is very tolerant. Right? He is atmaram. He is self-satisfied. So, uh, so Krishna is the one, first of all, he is self-satisfied. So in that sense, he is Atmaram. So for, he does not need, need any external source to be blissful. But for us, we can experience Ananda only in association with Krishna. We might have some glimpse of Ananda of being self-satisfied, but it's not sustaining. right? So that is what it's referring. So that, that's, that's where the personality comes into picture. And Krishna is the only form or the original form in which all these five relationships fully manifest. See, Rama, he was Ekapatni Vrata. That means if somebody wants to have conjugal affection towards Lord Rama 
only sita devi can have it so the sages of dand karanya forest they had approached rama he say that uh, you know your your body is so uh, you know attractive we desire that we we assume we get a female form and we want to be your queens and we want to saw you in that form but uh, uh, rama said that uh, i am ek patni vrata so i cannot accept anyone else so conjugal affection to lord rama is only possible for sita devi no one else same same thing applies for vishnu who can be the consort of vishnu only lakshmi who can be the parents of rama only dashrath and the queens right who can be the friend of the king you know rama we see here limited friends krishna is a cowherd boy when you talk about krishna we are not talk, not talking about mathura krishna that is another form of krishna there is dwarka krishna krishna the original personality of god it refers to vrindavan krishna gokul krishna right so krishna is a son of a cowherd boy right in a village everyone is a parent so krishna can accept unlimited parents and he would expand into so many different forms you know he is in the home of yashoda meya then he is also stealing butter at home of another gopi right another gopi is chastising him why did you steal butter right so parents their duty is chastising he likes that he does not want to be looked upon as god right that is the greatness of krishna because as soon as you know that he is god that means you cannot have this relation okay oh he is god i cannot uh, oh, how can i be a friend of god oh he is he is god how can i chastise god right so they all they don't know they are made to forget by krishna's arrangement that he is the supreme personality of god then they can have that friendship with him that they can have conjugal affection so he is unlimited friends in the village everyone is his friend he can expand he has unlimited he can ex, he can expand into unlimited forms and accept unlimited wives 16108 wives yet but he is not limited by that number he can expand even further right not only that the gopis he was not even wedded to them so what in this material world is considered by uh, you know material conception uh, love outside of marriage is considered immoral but there is nothing immoral for krishna he is not he is not influenced by lust even that in devotees who have that kind of emotion they can worship krishna right so krishna is the is the original perfect form in which all these five relationships can be fully manifest between the devotees and the lord and he is not limited in the what i mean by that is that he can he, he i am limited if i am you know taking this class i cannot be with my family members or my friends or cannot be i cannot expand i am limited krishna is unlimited so that's what it means so that's why the word bhagwan or the personality of god it is the source of all joy that's the only form that can provide all joy in all different five forms of relationships unlimitedly to all the living entities of the world does it make sense uh yes yes so, so the, the, the five relations relation mentioned are to get get ananda, ananda and what is that we need to do for getting sat sat and uh, chit is it or or what to do the same thing for all three of them so the thing is since bhagwan is the source of all both sat chit and ananda there is nothing ex, uh, you know externally uh, nothing extraneous that needs to be done to get sat and chit you know he is he will simultaneously provide sat chit and anand okay when one goes to progressive phases of realization he said okay i'll get the brahman realization first but that is only going to provide sat then he said i'm going to get chit realization or the parmatma realization then in parmatma realization we will get sat and chit but we are not doing that we are we are we are, we are directly the the bhakti marg is directly worshiping the lord and so as the original source he will provide both sat chit all three things sat chit and anand there is there is no separate process to get one versus another in in, in the in the bhakti mark in the devotional process they are all three simultaneously satisfied just like you know i am hungry i need nutrition i am malnourished right or under you know uh, and then uh, i am i am my hunger is there and i have not eaten good food for a long time so when i eat food all three are satisfied at the same time i the, the, the hankering for the taste that hankering is satisfied 
the fire in the belly, the hunger that is satisfied and the body is nourished. All three are satisfied. So nourishment is like sat, uh, you know, chit, I, maybe it's not a good comparison to directly do, but you get the idea, right? So yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, the way you explained, you know, I, I was actually going through this uh, sat chit on the uh, term a lot of time by now. And I never got an uh, explanation like this uh, before. So uh, thank you very much for explaining this. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Well, I'm just, uh, as I said, you know, I'm just uh, repeating what I read. So uh, I don't have any personal credit. Uh, all the credits uh, goes to Srila Prabhupada and all the Acharyas who presented this. Uh, so thank you. I'll just pass that appreciation to those who really deserve. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on this? Okay, so in Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, second chapter, 11th verse, the these three phases are further described. Vadanti tat tattva vidas tattvam yaj jnanam advayam brahmeti paramatma iti bhagavan iti sabdhyate. The absolute truth is realized in three phases of understanding by the knower of the absolute truth and all of them are identical such phases of the absolute truth are brahman paramatma and bhagavan so i you know we already discussed what is brahman what is paramatma and bhagavan uh, there could be further that could be said on this much more technical analysis but we'll save it for some other time i think the essence of what this verse is saying i think i already explained that so with your permission, if that's fine, I think we can go ahead. There is another example that is given in this regard to explain Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. This is the example of the sun. So the sun has three features. One is sunshine. The second is the surface of the sun and the sun globe itself. So sun can be perceived in three different ways. For instance, in the dawn, you know, uh, the summertime, we see that sunlight or the dawn happens quite early in the morning. The sun has actually not risen, right? And even before the sun rises, and I'm not looking out of the window, you know, I might be in the room, but just being in my room, and even if not the windows are open, you feel the light inside, right? Maybe all the curtains are down, everything's down, but still, right? It's not pitch dark. Like if you do the same thing in the night, even if the, you know, it's pitch dark, if you don't have the lights turned on, you cannot see anything. That means the sun is perceived by the sunlight, even if you're not see, looking outside. The sunlight is present everywhere, right? It's, it's pres it goes into every nook and corner, right? Even if there is a shadow, that shadow is not so dark that I cannot see anything, right? Even if a sh shadow falls, but because there is light everywhere. So Brahman is like that. The Brahman feature or the effulgence of the uh, that is emanating from the spiritual planets and the spiritual form of the Lord, it is pervading the entire universe. The only section where it is covered is where this material universe, where repeated birth and death happens, the, the Brahman Jyoti is covered, it, it does not reach there. But once a yogi goes beyond his material creation, he, that, that yogi is, believe, is, is, uh, is blinded actually by that powerful light which is emanating from spiritual planets. So Brahman is like that. So it, it, you know, one can, one can perceive, uh, just like one can perceive sun through sunlight. Similarly, the absolute truth, the first phase of realization is Brahman realization. Even before somebody, when you go progressively, now, you know, in devotional path, we are directly approaching Bhagavan because it's not needed to go through that sequential phase. But in general, the first realization of, of uh, the absolute truth in a sequential order would be eternality or Brahman. Just like the sun, the first level of realization is sunlight. The next is sun surface, right? And that can be compared to the Paramatma realization. So, by, you know, different apparatus or tools or, you know, advanced telescopes, one can study in detail the surface of the sun, right? So, they see that 
on the surface of the sun, there are these huge solar flares um, that are, you know, hundreds of miles long, which are always emanating all the time. And you can find very high resolution images um, because of all the re research that's done. So that surface of the sun can be studied, right? And one can know that, oh, why is the light coming? Because, you know, it's like, every single moment like hundreds of hydrogen bombs are being exploded that's the amount of energy that is being produced and then the solar flares is actually the source of light so that is a more detailed understanding of where that sunshine is coming from similarly the brahman uh, beyond the brahman realization one can understand that okay brahman is eternal but along with eternality there is another form of the lord paramatma which is not just eternal but is all knowing and so that's a little bit more detailed understanding, just like the sun understanding of the sun surface is more detailed understanding than just the sunshine. And beyond that is the actual sun globe, right? So that we do not have direct experience because we don't know anything, uh, uh, at least in terms of uh, scientific invention or technology that can survive that amount of high temperature to actually, uh, you know, go and probe the, the, the surface, uh, actually uh, actually the globe of the sun itself to land over there, for instance. Uh, but in the Vedic scriptures, we find that there are subtle entities who have the forms, which is not any biological forms, but subtle forms that uh, they don't feel that heat. Like, so the sun is yoked by sun chariot, uh, on a chariot by Arunadev, and you know is driven by a chariot driver and you know there are the sages the vahalikyas which are 60000 in number their size of a thumb so all these uh, descriptions are there in the scriptures but their experience which we can only imagine but their experience of the the sun planet is what uh, would be much more detailed than any kind of scientific investigation that we might do with uh, different probes or you know uh, images that we might get uh, uh, from any spaceship or other space-based uh, telescopes, Hubble's telescope, for instance, right? Similarly, the Bhagawan understanding is much more detailed and a perfect understanding of Brahman, uh, then, then the Brahman understanding or the Paramatma understanding, the Bhagawan understanding is full and complete. Similarly, the just like just like the understanding of the sun planet as experienced by elevated beings like aruna dev uh, who can directly uh, are engaged in the service of uh, uh, following the orbit of the sun uh, as 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 uh, planned or chalked out by krishna himself in brahma samhita there is this verse that even sun moon and other luminaries they are uh, following the order of Krishna and they, they are, uh, you know, going in a particular orbit, right? Uh, so their experience is much more. So this is an analogy, just like, you know, how we can understand Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagwan. There is a progressive understanding, just like there is a progressive understanding of the sun sign, the sun surface and the sun planet. That's all what it is saying. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? All good. Uh, okay. So I think this is just elaboration of the same thing what I mentioned that uh, sun sign is universally pervasive, just like the Brahman is universally pervasive. Then the advanced knowledge is a sun disk, just like you know, similarly Paramatma knowledge is an advanced knowledge. And finally, one who can enter the heart of the sun, so naming also like Aruna Dev. They are compared to those who know the personal features of the absolute truth. So we discuss that. Okay, therefore, bhaktas or the transcendentalists who have realized the Bhagawan feature of the absolute truth are the topmost transcendentalists. Although all students who are engaged in the study of absolute truth are engaged in the same subject matter. So you're saying that uh, like the jnanis, they only want the impersonal understanding of the Lord. They don't have the idea of Paramatma, for instance. The yogis, they have, you know, advanced understanding of Paramatma, but the Bhaktas, they not only, the Bhaktas, they have the understanding of Bhagwan, which is beyond the Brahman realization or the Paramatma realization. That's what it's saying. Uh, 
okay the word bhagwan is explained by great authority parasar muni so we already talked about that right so father of vyasdev himself he explains what the word bhagwan means and then i think we already discussed that the personality of god uh, who is possesses all the six opulences all riches all strength all fame all beauty all knowledge and all renunciation is called bhagwan and then we looked into specific examples in the personality of krishna that how he is great in all the six opulences we already did that um, so yeah only krishna can claim this because he is the supreme personality of godhead no one can claim that he possesses all riches all strength etc entirely we also talked about that you know first of all nobody has all this in equal amount and even if they have they don't have in the, have it in the same amount as the lord okay so no living entity including brahma shiva narayana can possess opulences as fully as krishna so in one way narayana does possess everything but when it comes to rasa he, he narayana in that in the form in the from the perspective of rasa he is not complete in the sense that narayana only lakshmi can be the wife narayana no one can be the friend right who can be the father of narayana in, Vai, in vaikuntha there is no you know that there, there, there is no parental affection vaikuntha where narayana resides no one becomes the parent of narayana uh, but in his original form is krishna he accepts parents though he is the father of everyone right in krishna will uh, in bhagavad gita will later learn krishna says i am i am the seed giving father he is the original father of everyone but he he willingly be, wants to become a child of his some of his devotees and he wants to be chastised like mother yashoda and he is not faking he is when mother yashoda is chastising him he is not faking by the arrangement of yog maya he is actually made to forget that he is supreme personality of god and just like an ordinary child krishna is shivering and crying but he you know by that he gives pleasure to his devotee and he also wants to experience that uh, so that is the greatness of krishna therefore in brahma brahma samhita lord brahma himself says that krishna is the supreme personality of god so brahma samhita uh, it had 100 chapters all of them are lost except for the fifth chapter which was found by chaitanya mahaprabhu in south india during his presence it is a glorification of krishna and also a description of the spiritual world that you don't find in other scriptures and you might have heard brahma samhita recited especially in the beginning of any homam you know traditionally this phrase are always chanted so here brahma is glorifying krishna he saying ishvara parama krishna satchidananda vigraha anadir adir govinda sarva karana karanam so ishvara is controller and there are different controllers i am the controller of the domain that i have been assigned authority over the president of the united state has the domain of authority over the country at least to some extent you know he thinks he can control but you know as we see that control is also limited similarly demigods they have also their own authority vayu has the authority over wind agni has the authority of fire over fire all over the universe right so these they are all controllers but who is the original controller who is the greatest controller brahma is saying brahma is the source of all the demigods he is the first being in this creation he himself is saying ishvara paramah krishna krishna is the supreme controller and who is this krishna he is not only sat he is not only chit he is anand also sat chit anand vigraha vigraha means form right he is not formless see it can be as clear as it, you know you can say vigraha it's not formless vigraha means it's a form it's a personality and that personality is full of all knowledge all eternality and all bliss anadir adir govind anadi means adi means beginning anadi means who has no beginning one he is one who does not have any beginning yet he is the beginning of everything else adir he does not have a beginning but he is the beginning of everything else and govind govind means one who gives pleasures to the cows and he gives pleasures to the senses of all living entities right so that goes back to anand we we all want anand who can fulfill our anand govinda can fulfill our anand no one can fully satisfy our desire for happiness only govinda can why because he is anand vigraha 
and then sarva karana karana means the cause of all causes that's what this verse is saying this is the very first verse in brahma samhita and there is there are many other nice verses that describe uh, the personality of godhead so i think we are already 631 i know this is uh, we took quite some time but i, I think it is very important it, you know it firmly establishes who that uh, personality of god it is uh, so some purports are like this you know you might need more time and then other purports we can go faster but i just feel that it's worth the time that we spent um, i just want to see if we can finish this in few more minutes if not we can continue next time that's all right i think is that fine with everyone i think we are it's already 6:32 we'll complete the remaining purport next time and then um, take it along from there or as if you want me to continue i i, I don't mind uh, but I, i just don't want to call everyone um it it should be all right if you want to do it next time any opinions Okay, uh, I think we. I saw a chat message. Let's see. Okay, Kashyap uh, says okay. He's okay to continue. Um. Okay, thank you. So, someone else also said again. I don't want to hold anyone. Uh, everyone. I mean, if everyone's fine, we'll continue, or else we'll we will uh, we can. Okay, so I think some of you need to drop. Uh, in that case, uh, you know. we can we can continue next time not a problem okay is that is it fine yep yep okay yes thank you very much and uh, you know uh, we'll we'll talk uh, next uh, week thank you hari krishna hari krishna hari krishna thank you hari krishna hari krishna hari krishna thank you hari krishna hari krishna thank you Thank you. 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 Thank you.